adhere to those um, standards, having the awards. They have a dinner in England, I think. Everyone goes up to the lake district. Um, goes up the lake, has, a, has a dinner. They will have our little nibbles. I think there's more coming. Um, and chips. We also have the certificates, which Chris created. Um, and they're very similar to the, um, the Bob Graham ones. They're really sort of, and they've got Colin Rolfe there, the guy, the, the, the legend, who's the guy, who um, did it in Sub 24. He sadly passed um, two, two absolute visionaries of the uh, ultra running wilderness community have gone. But we'll keep this going and their legacy. Um, so, yeah, yeah, 2021, yes. Uh, I was looking at the stats and I was thinking, far out. Well, it didn't seem that long ago that me and Tom Crompton were putting out food drops for Chris and um, Lawrence down the main range in a storm. It doesn't seem that long ago. I think it was like 2017 or something. Um, these two crazy guys from England wanted to go down the main range. Um, and uh, we were there. That, that's a reasonable long time, reasonably long time ago now. And I was looking at the stats. So, so since that time, which I don't know if you guys feel the same, but time goes quick. And I don't know if it's having kids, but <laughs> I was looking at the stats. I say 68 attempts, 31 sub 24 hour successes. That's awesome, eh? So that that's just epic. Um, it's an epic number of people who have taken the challenge to do something that is, which I, I initially thought was basically impossible, and now I've done a um, escape. Two six three. No. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice try, Sam. So, um, um, I've done, I've done like the vanilla version. Uh, well, nearly. It was only, it just puts me. It just, the, the things these people are doing. So much stuff's getting that's happening that is beyond like your average person. It's almost like Fight Club. You know, when people look at each other, they've got the stare. Fight Club stare. They know it's. Uh, so many people will say, oh, I've gone out and done this, and they'll just say things like, why, or what's wrong with you, and you don't have to do that, and all this, but everyone here knows why. Um, I think Dan says something quite special tonight, he goes, uh, it's beyond, you want to know what's the other side, on the other side of pain, it's like a mirror, you go on the other side and you see the world in a different way. There is an element of that with ultra sports, there's a real, they talk about transcendence and the ability to be close to nature. I really do think there's something in it, you know, like there's going for a run for three hours and you go back to your job and so but there's something about being immersed in nature for a long time. It really crystallises the beauty of the place. So that's one aspect of it, but the other aspect of it is just epic what you guys are doing. I'm just it's privileged to be sort of a um, Roger Robertson as Chris used to call me, I think Rogers from the beach Bob Graham around doing all the stacks. Although I do feel like I've got the t-shirt now because uh, I did it in one push. I was thinking, oh, I didn't do it in sub 24 hours at the Skate Valley, but, you know, I didn't have a sleep, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we've had 31 sub 24 hour successes. Um, we had about um, 10 attempts this year on this uh, SK main range. 11, there was a few people who had um, problems with their stomach. Chris Fahey actually tried initially, had real bad stomach problems. We had the awesome uh, three, the Andy Strang, Andy Thompson, Walter Thorburn elite party that just narrowly missed out. I think it was 27. Then there was, um, there were a couple of other attempts as well. Um, but we still got six people through for the season. Um, that was really epic. We'll do this. We'll do the SK award at the end for the certificates. But um, I'll just give you some of the um, stats now that um, we did it this season. So we had um, the 30 and 31st were Hannah Lund from Danny Burke and Ashley Graham from Fokatani. They did it in 23:35. They can't make it tonight, but um, they are they're awesome, eh? They're young ladies. I put a sign out there on the SMR because it was a horrible day, I knew the weather was coming in and that would have been in a nightmare scenario on the SMR. But they did it, they, that was so epic that they carried all of that. 23.35, then you had Stephen Molyneux, um, he did it in 22.53, Unseat Orchard. Ryan Carr, our first ever Amberley um, competitor. We all know <laughs> Ryan Carr, he's a bit of a big name 
in the ultra running <coughs> world and nice running road and also a really great guy. I had a good chat to him at that cafe. He just um, came and smashed a 21.13. He was meant to be doing that Tim Tilaktaro mountain race, I think, but he, that, that, that was cancelled here. That instead. He's <laughs> 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 biking around the country, yeah. Some awesome people out there, right? Uh, 27th was Chris Fahey, um, the Belmont Burt Monk. We all know him, he's a local legend, 2308. Then we had, oh, and we had Sam in 2116. Before that was Josh Campbell, 2348. Um, we'll do the certificates at the end, but I just gave you some of the um, main range stats there. Um, and also, um, we had all we've got a larger club now with the all three SKs in under 24 hours. Now this is the what is called premium class. Now it's, not, <laughs> it's something that people just you know people create discounts. We all know what <laughs> discounts you'll get and whiskey. A lifetime, you get yeah, whiskey discounts and whiskey. You get a free lifetime free parking at Waitoki, <laughs> or you can eat at the Koru, Koru Club Lounge. Just tell the lady at the desk. And the SK is fine. Matthew says it's okay. <laughs> didn't work. No. Well, just show them the okay. website. She said I needed a scale or something. Yeah. About. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, Josh Campbell, <laughs> Stephen Molyneux, Tim Pickering, Joe Murphy. Joe just keeps smashing out these big epics. I think he just he just did a winter tiny SK. Kyle Malone, Paul Helm, in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> and a guy that decided that the bike is better than his legs, Greg O'Cleary. Someone's got to steal his bike soon, mate. Just... <laughs> or his legs. <laughs> or his legs. And obviously, Tim Sutton, who started off the craziness. Um, we you thought that was crazy. We've got one class above that. It's called Platinum. And you do all the SKs in reverse, the KSs. And Joe Murphy has started on that journey. As well. so you can always get bigger. That is the rule. Um, and then we've got 1500s. Um, I always wondered if you know, all these people who are doing these epic things, that are there, they'll always want bigger. That's how it works. I thought, you know, what's bigger than the SK main range? Potentially the, well, not potentially, the 1500s, which Tim and Jean have managed, um, Jean Beaumont. Um, then there's the that Ruahini Traverse that Eleanor and Katie Wright did this year was just beyond epic. They're, they've got an amazing pedigree of doing big things, but I thought that was one of the one of the year's amazing feats. Um, yeah, so. Other than that, um, the SKs, we've also got the silver medal SK, and well, I don't know, is it a silver medal, the tiny SK? I don't know how oh, you it's, it's the best, you reckon? It's but, um, easier though. <laughs> 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 so, if you're not up, you know. <clears throat> it's the great thing I think about it. We've got three kinds of SKs now. You've got different ones. Uh, you've got the the one, the the Holy Grail one, the main range, which you get stiff before. You've got the Tarn, which is some people, yeah, like Tim was saying, it's probably potentially more epic in its in its relief down that Tarn range. Um, there's actually been 21 Tarn SKs now as well, so that's the another really impressive number. Um, with three new Tarn SKs, three people doing a Tarn SK, um, Josh Campbell, 23.15, Katie Wright and Ellen Arts, 22.36, um, and Joe Murphy's just recently did the winter Tarn SK as well. KS. KS. <laughs> I mean, it's gone so fast now, there's people just going up and down. And this, and this, I said, like, we're doing the stats for the season, he goes, the season's never over. So, they're trying to bamboozle you. Hey? They're trying to bamboozle you. But it's just great people are taking up the challenge, and um, as long as we keep formalising it and we've got the stats there, people have a lot of information that they can just go to. I really like, but what I really like is the SK for the mortal man, and I call that the Valley's SK. That's for people <laughs> who, who, like, Craig, Craig can tell you about it. When he came, when he started looking at SK, he goes, You guys are madmen, you know. 
was going, maybe I could do a Valleys. <laughs> maybe I could do a Valleys SK. Ian and I had a go at it. Um, in Atkinson and I had a go uh, like years ago when um, we went the wrong way initially and then we had a <laughs> went the wrong way because there was a track we were trying to sidle around the room hunger that was in flood and we were stuck out there for a long time doing to sidle and so I bagged, bailed in soldiered on because he's hard uh, more hardcore than me and made it then I tried again and I had a um, saw really sore hills had sort of problems with my hills and I managed to do it in 24 17. Um, last summer with Craig and John Mellish, but it really was an awesome. We loved it. it just because what it was doing was just felt like a real adventure, and there was magic in that valley at dawn at Rumahanga, and we felt like we were part of something bigger than us, and it was just such a good vibe, and the community that came together to support us. So it was something that we felt with our abilities we could do if we kept going, and um, I think that's the good thing about SK Valleys. It's good. It's a, it's a sort of an attempt, uh, a thing that a lot of people think is mad as well, but it's, and even, I think Michael said even it was a bit harder than he imagined. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll come to you in a minute, mate, because that was awesome. <laughs> but, um, the warm up. It's not easy. It's not easy, that valley's, but um, actually 55 people have done it now, which under 24 hours. It's amazing. Um, so good on everyone that's done the valley's. <laughs> Most recently, Martin McCrudden, I have to mention him, 1310, FKT, unbelievable. He's not human. That's an amazing, I just can't get my head around that. 1310. 13, 13, 13. Yeah, he had a wire and then still didn't need his head book. That guy's got to be a name for a good race. One, one stages. He had a tail end though, eh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Dan Pringle did an awesome 1658, then there was um, mine, Craig and John's, they did 2342, I did 2417, but there, there was a few more the previous summer. But yeah, 55 in total there, that's that's <coughs> cool. So if you're thinking, if anyone's watching this and they're thinking about an SK beginner level, and but I would really encourage you to have a think about the SK Valleys because it is achievable if you just keep just keep your, I'd say keep your nutrition right. Um, really concentrate on the route in terms of don't take it lightly or chat to people on the way too much because you have to be really focused and just keep going and don't stop. You'll you you'll make it in the end to the car park of glory. Um, yeah, so we've got three SKs there. Yeah, so this evening, what we'll do then, so that was just some of the stats, and to welcome you to the, um, the, the evening. It's great to see so many people here. Oh yeah, I will mention what Michael's amazing. He's been, he's just seen what we're doing here and went, you oh, know, yeah, that's all right, but I might just do doubles. <laughs> <laughs> so he's done a double main range SK, and the weather he did it in, it's just, you know, just to be up there, you just wouldn't want to be there. I don't think people realize how epic. It's like um, you see some of those stories on the, see the documentaries about Everest and the mountain and stuff, but for him to be up there in an exhausted state and in those conditions and push through to a main range double SK, it's surely got to be one of the most more epic feats that happen in the year in New Zealand. Prince and, stupid, mate. So, <laughs> but a lot yeah. of courage as well, mate. So it's really inspiring for the people who can do big stuff. You, there's always another level. I think you definitely are up there at a very, very high level. I know you've got pedigree for the 200 mile races like Gene has in it, but it's really good to inspire others. And he's just recently completed a, another double, the Tarn, Winter Tarn SK, coming back from the Valley's warm down. But it wasn't a warm down, was it? That's <laughs> 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 a bit of a suffer on the return. Suffer on the return. But well done, mate. Thanks for coming. It's really good to see you. Thank you. So what we'll do now, we'll have two talks. Um, we'll have a talk from Andy Crothers, who does, he gets uh, six leave passes a year, and when he, when he uses them up, he certainly gets his money's worth, because they're always epic mountaineering sort of um, things down south. Don't look at his photos, because it's depressing, especially if you're, <laughs> if you're at a computer and a lot of
which is why I seem to be a lot of the time. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've got obviously Jean Beaumont, a lot of people will know her of her name already. Um, she'll have a brief chat about the 1500. Um, amazing. Oh, I was going to talk for ages on it. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm going on a bit actually. This is meant to be a good pair in Paula, uh, the warmer. So, yeah, so who wants to go first, Andy or Jean? To you guys. I'm happy to go. Do you want to go first? I'll go first. Okay, Jean Beaumont, if you want to Do you want these? No, I'm going to win it. <laughs> Got that. Right. Um, you know how when you hear that someone's done something really amazing um, and then you just think in your mind, I want to do that too, that's awesome, you have no hesitation. That's what I felt when uh, Tim did the 1500s, um, Colin Rolf had done it. When I did the main range, it was the same. Um, listening to Chris Swallow, Lawrence Pitcott, Colin again. Um, no one can say don't do it, it's stupid, even though I was scared shitless, and that's what took me so long to actually get on and do the 1500s, because I was quite scared to do it on my own, to be honest. Um, I wanted to do it uh, seriously, I was looking at October um, last year, but I just could not get a break with the weather, with my days off, it was always like foul weather, you know, with the floods in Plymouth, thunderstorms, snow in summer, was just hopeless and then I just saw a couple of nice days and I thought right I've got to do it I'm sure other people are sniffing around I need to get out there and get that thing done <laughs> so I managed to get a couple of shift swaps from work had a nice lunch with Tim asking him a few questions about the um, 1500s my husband uh, teed up dropped me off I thought right I'm going to do it I'm going to do it so two nice days up in Southerly which is classic Tararua weather so um, Got up at 2 a.m. Um, and we drove to Putara. Um, apparently, I have to talk about poo, so we got to Putara and <laughs> I saw there was a light at the car park. I wasn't surprised because I thought it was such gorgeous weather, someone else going to want to do this cave this weekend. And I just had to go now. <laughs> and I went, Oh, holy shit, excuse the pun, yelling out to Tony, stop the car! Because I knew I couldn't like, do it with someone in the car park field. And I just leapt, I couldn't even get over the fence, it was all a bit of a shambles anyway. But uh, stuff to say, I had no more problems in that regard the whole of the country. So it was an auspicious start, I thought, to the whole affair. Um, so it was really neat to see uh, Chris Fahey at the car park, and he started maybe. 10 minutes before me or something, so our plan was to start about 4.30, so I think I got going 4.35, which is pretty good. Um, all went well to hear a pie hut. I was pretty scared, out, to be honest, I was scared, I admit it. And uh, I thought, oh, he's going to drive away as soon as I leave the car park. <laughs> anyway, thought if I crap out here a pie hut, I'm going to have to come back and hitchhike all the way around. <laughs> Anyway, that's what went through my head, which is true. Um, anyway, I got up to here if I had okay, and up past the hut. Um, I was surprised how cold it was. Uh, the Holdsworth Jumbo race was the day before, and I think the weather was really crap on that. But it was still really cold southerly. Um, uh, all the foliage was really wet, and I put my jacket on, my gloves on, my gloves got wet, I was pretty cold, I thought, oh, you stupid woman. <laughs> you were naughty, and even though the forecast was good, and there was 100% chance of no rain, you did only bring your Montane Minimus bunny jacket, <laughs> left the at home. <laughs> but anyway, I got away with it. I had other puffer jackets and stuff I could have put on, so... But uh, I thought, oh, well, once I get to the top, the sun comes out, it's going to be a nice day, and I'll warm up and it'll be okay. But I was kind of surprised. I hadn't thought of the wet foliage from the rain, and look how it's soaked on, actually. 
It was all good. I was pretty excited to get to Logan and write on my technical sheet at the time. So that took me four hours thirty. I thought I'd do it in like three hours, but I don't know where I plucked that out of. So. <laughs> in my uh, planning, I thought I would do it. I thought maybe thirty-four hours, fifteen hundreds, because I thought um, this is exactly how I did it. I thought. 24 hours for the main range, two hours for the banister out and back, two hours for the uh, mitre out and back, four hours to go down to mid and up the other side, so it's eight hours, another couple of hours for extra bits and pieces, contingency, so 34 hours. <laughs> That's pretty much what I did. <laughs> I don't know how other people work out times for these things. It's only a couple of hours out, but it's alright. <laughs> um, so, Logan was good, got there. Um, the weather was beautiful. Um, by then, the wind died off, sun came out, and I was drying out, and it was all good. Um, I hadn't decided how to tackle banister, like in what order, like a red part, a red banister. But when I saw Bannister, um, I thought, oh, I could see the track down. I thought, I'll just side all down, do Bannister first. I had tons of water left because it took uh, about a litre, 75, and I had um, like tons left because it was so cold. So I just went straight, sidled down, got away with it. Don't do the sidle too early because there was some leather wood there, but I managed to get through. Uh, I dropped my pack off at the bottom and put a little note on it. You know, otherwise known as the Tim Sutton note. Um, so don't, don't take my pack, I'm going up there. <laughs> I had a little uh, Ultimate Direction Halo pack that had my peel bit in it and I just had that already in there and I just added a couple of gels, some water, my phone and went up and did banister on that. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. I um, got up, I like the little narrow ridge in between banister and I like to call it Rolf Peak because it's the only unnamed 1500s peak in the Tower Range. I reckon we should work I on that. We need to <coughs> get onto that. We need to form a committee and get that named <laughs> somehow. That'd be great, so I ate a sausage up there for him. I thought about. Then <laughs> um, got back down. Then I thought, um, now what? A red, a red part? Which way? <laughs> But I was above a red part, I thought, well, I'm not going down to the hut and then up, that would be stupid. So I just went straight up a red and down to the hut and filled up my water there. Um, I, I can't say how much, too much about how it was such a beautiful day. It wasn't even hot, it was just perfect conditions, so I was pretty lucky there. Um, well, actually, I planned it that way. I wasn't going to do it unless it was perfect. After my main range, the weather was crap the whole time. I couldn't see anything. I thought, I'm not doing that again. So... Um, so I got to Tarnbridge Hut all right, I kind of was surprised the climb at the end of Tarnbridge, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, filled up with water there because I thought I'm going to have to do water at the Tarns um, after my minor peak out and back, so it's going to be a wee while until I get water. Um, dropped my pack again at Gerbstone, and that was a pretty steep climb as well. But I was kind of happy, and I was just looking at the peaks and thinking, you're next mate, and <laughs> it's going to be alright. Um, I don't really have any too many issues with just wanting to quit or anything. It was just such a good day. Um, we did the out and back. Um, I remember looking up at Mitre and just going, oh, that's quite a long way. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, it was pretty good to knock off Earlstone, Rocket, Mitre, Piggies. You know, it's a good little Thanks. amount to put on my list there. Um, when I got back to Girdlestone, I thought, oh yeah, I'm not going to make Holsworth before dark, which was my cunning plan initially, but um, I, yeah, it was pretty good. I just went up Adkin, was alright, and I was getting perhaps a little tired, but it's just keeping going, keeping going. Um, filled up at the Mid King Tarn, which was only like that deep and quite dirty, so it's put an aqua tap, there's like animal prints all around it. <laughs> <laughs> Drunk bad, he knew I was alright. <laughs> I remember thinking, come on, like it took me ages to, you know when you get tired, it seems to take you a long time to do anything, and I'm just like, yeah. it took me ages to fill up this bottle, and it's not going, you know, like, come on, and I get much stress there, but, um, and then of course I get to South, King Town, which is way better. <laughs> 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 I didn't wait until that one, but uh, 
the whole way through I was kind of thinking where am I going to get my next quarter from because there's no streams, you know, so you've got to have that a good capacity of water but um, uh, with my not quite two litres it was heaps for me but I think if it's a hot day you'd probably need more there's a big guy um, sneak side all the broken X pinnacles which did the cheeks why I just thought, you know, come on <coughs> don't usually do that um, I went up the right side of McGregor because I knew that was the way to go from my recce with Katie Wright when I got to the top of there actually it was um the amazing um like orange mist the sun was setting. It's just you know, when you're out the out up there, eh, that's when you see just sights that just remember forever, they're like a photograph in your mind and you never forget. And um I thought, oh shit, I have to take a compass because I was trying to just use my map and compass. Not your view range. You know, I didn't have my watch. Well, I had my view range back up, but I was trying not to use that. I don't really need to in the day. Um, but anyway, it cleared and I could just see angle knob off in the distance. And I was like, oh, I think I'm going to make it before dark. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to angle knob. Um, yeah, probably halfway between angle knob and um, jumbo. I was getting dark. I was getting tired, so I felt very sleepy about that time. Um, but when I got to Jumbo Knob I, and I saw the first like marker pole, I thought, yeah, that's what it's all about. Yes, my plan has come to fruition. I can follow the track to the end. The marked route. Because <laughs> even like, you know, Tarn Ridge is kind of flat and all these, just difficult, I think, to find in the dark. Um, it's surprisingly how hard it is to navigate the dark. You know, no, so I've done it the right way around. Um, uh, yeah, the whole way from Jumbo to Holsworth felt very sleepy and tired, but carried on. Um, when I got to Holsworth, I thought I'm going to have a sit down. <laughs> I hadn't had a rest at all, so I'm going to have a stop just because I raced through the huts and didn't even go in them. Grab my water, I was all like, go, go, go. And um, I just sat down and um, might be known, turned my head torch off and um, you know, it was just still uh, the moon, don't forget that stupid moon the other night. This <laughs> moon. It was like orange, red, it was amazing moon wise. It was like so incredibly, the colour was fantastic. And the stars were out, and it was just so absolutely deathly silent. There's not a sound anything. So, anyway, I took a gel or whatever, and um, I wake up after that. So that was good. Just that little sit down for five minutes, just really, I know, invigorated me. And I was like, oh, no, go going down the bush again into the dark, right down to the valley. <laughs> 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 but anyway. So I went down, that was kind of, it was quite freaky going down there, it was kind of, um, there's just spider webs everywhere, I don't think anyone had been down there for a couple of days and I was just like, sticking spider webs and, but the moorporks were calling and goats were smelling, the male goats, there's only a male goat can do, and rustling the bushes and um, when I got to the bottom I, I just went straight past the hut, there was water to the right, but I didn't know where that was. I, I'll get lost if I go and try and find the water. There's a hut water somewhere over there. So I knew there was a stream. Um, so there's a little tiny stream and I filled up there. Because I'd forgotten about the bigger stream. <laughs> so that took me quite a while to fill up with this little chip and then I like to see it. And then of course you go like 100 metres and there's the big stream. <laughs> really what's that and one just across the bridge, the only the only two decent streams on the whole of the 1500s K. And those are it, pretty much. Um, so when I started to climb up, I was quite pleased to climb because that's a really steep down and it's such a hot to start to climb. And I just thought, right, don't stop, just go up right to the top. And um, I was kind of hearing a lot of voices. And, you know how stream murmurings and things you think they're people and people listen. When I got to the top, I just, you know, woohoo, got to the main range. This is awesome. Um, and again, still no wind, beautiful night, it was amazing. Um, 
Oh, well, we, I'd forgotten though, because when I did the SK main range, it was cloudy, I couldn't see anything, and I don't even remember it. I just went well, along that bit. I don't remember much about it, but it seemed to be a lot of up and down, up and down, up and down, and I spent the whole time to mung a hook a hut go, oh, I picked the wrong route. <laughs> So I basically decided to pick that route instead of it at Holsworth, instead of going near Winchcombe that way. I thought, well, if I go down Midwahine, up uh, Kaparangi, I'm following a track and I'll just know, you know, I can't get lost. <laughs> Do something stupid. And I had Ricky in near Winchcombe Ridge a couple of years before and I didn't like it or why it was a bit windy and hard to follow. And I forgot to fill up the water at the bottom and all the disastrous trips here on the Spiley and stuff. <laughs> so that's why I went that way. Um, and I think the thought of going to Holsworth and going the other way away from Hector, like down, I, I didn't seem right, but maybe it was. Um, anyway, it seemed to take a long time to get to Mother Hooker Hutch. Um, got some water there. The steel ladder was cool in the dark, like looking into the abyss. And that's pretty neat. Um, <laughs> I know, it's cool. Um, got to, I think that was day was breaking in, it was about year 5 a.m. and um, a surprising amount of like overgrown track there, maybe they'd cut it now, but I couldn't even see the track at all. The foliage was this high after my hooker and after the ladder, so again if I'd been in the dark, it would be quite hard to actually find your way through. I was kind of surprised to see that on the main range track, I thought maybe, you know. Like a highway. It wasn't. <laughs> um, it seemed like a really, really big climb up to Bridge Peak. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember that from the main range. You know, I can't remember this being a big climb. I think it was just in the mist that you just follow. You know, you can't see it. I was like, oh, looking up. Well, I thought, right, you're not going to look back at the view until you get to the top. <laughs> so I was like, no, don't look back. You've got to get to the top. When I got to the top, I just looked back and I just thought, because it's beautiful day. And I could just see the like, vanished way in the distance of the light. I thought, oh my god, I've come up. That's, holy shit, that's a huge way that I've actually come. I was like, wow, I could really stuff. That's awesome. And then, um, shortcut to Kine Hut. Um, I sorted out some food there, which took a long time, and I was quite upset, actually. Quite upset. I only took four sausages. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> Needed about ten. <laughs> oh, the juicy, fatty, saltiness of the sausages was just the way to go. And I was, you know, only had four. I was disappointed. <laughs> um, anyhow, I got to Hector without any trouble, just because it was daylight and nice day and I just thought yeah and I was pretty stoked to get to Hector and I um, got a, saw a text from Tim and that was cool and um, I moaned about how long it had taken me. <laughs> I've written that down so I lost that. I think it took 12 hours, um, just over 12 hours to get from Angle Knob to Hector so fair, fair old while. Uh, although most of that was in the dark so I've got to allow for that I guess. Um, so it was amazing to see the dress circle on the Southern Crossing, like actually sort of in the daylight, nice weather. I think every time I've been here, it's always been like gale force wind or clouds or night. And I thought, oh, this looks nice in the day. <laughs> wow. Um, I got to Alpha OK and I meant to text Michael, my brother, and say that I couldn't get any coverage. I forgot you had to go to the balcony, I think. Um, when I got a bit down, from, I decided at Alpha that I would put my poles away. I thought, no, you're going down there, you don't need your poles. Because the whole time you've had them out. <laughs> I put them away and I sort of struggled for like 10 minutes and was going down and I could barely get up here. Oh my god, I just can't even go without my poles. Said, no, you're not having your poles. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a year, it was a we are not having our poles because I had a wee thing going. I thought that I was like two people, like a wee. <laughs> well, okay, cool. Shall we stop and have a drink? Yes, yes, yes we will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite strange, but 
Um, and then I thought, oh, I need to take a no dose. It's fine. I'm like going la la. Anyway, I took a no dose. You go, okay, you can use your colds. Got it. That's actually, I don't know why that was just really weird with sleep deprivation. But okay, you can have your poles, and um, you're not stopping now to get to end. So I, I would run down the hills as much as I could, or swing down on my poles for my legs to be tired, you know. And I go, and in my mind, I was just going, okay, you will run all the downs, and you will walk really fast on the ups to make up for the slow time that you're running on the downs. It didn't make sense, and I go, run all the downs, I'm really fast on the ups to make up. And I just said this over and over and over and over again, and you like. <laughs> but the march on ridges, I don't know, I really love it. And stuff. I, the bush is beautiful, it was getting hot. Um, and I wrote this because I just remember the little little Titi Kunamu, they're just like lots of them on there and a little in my head, a tweet away, and it was just really neat. It was warm and you know when the bush is really hot and it smells beautiful, like it brings out the scent and the spiciness and I just love that and I was going down and um, then when I got to the Smith's Creek shelter, I thought, oh, nearly there! <laughs> But I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> just went on and on and on. And on. Mm -hmm. But the cicadas were like really loud, like almost deafening all along there. That was really amazing. And, and then finally, when you get to those steps, oh, definitely going to be there. And it was really cool to finish and see my brother Michael was there and Josh was there, which is really awesome. And uh, car park of glory. That's yeah, it. nice. <laughs> And then I was moaning to Michael on the way home about hallucinating on the road and going, what the hell? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was it. Well done. Done. Job done. <laughs>
an hour sort of territory, and I broke a rev in the process, and we got it. <laughs> and like, it was just clambering crap, you know, um, cutting out everywhere, you know, the, the, the stuff. Anyway, we got to the end, and, and Hidden Falls was, you know, Hidden Falls, and we couldn't get anywhere. Yeah. So that was <laughs> And then we had another night out at, like, at sur late Serpentine, it was about negative 15 or something, and we crossed it up, and we, yeah. So we had two nights out, and, and we the last night was um, the last day. We just had half a box of chocolate between us to, to do the you know most of the or half of the five passes. We managed to get out. So yeah, that was our experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we did go back and do Snowy River, but like after 15 years of not doing a trip together, Jamie and I went back and did um, Snowy Hut together, and it was really great. Um, and we didn't get lost. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was um, so that was one of the stories I heard in, in preparing for uh, for this trip. Another one was, you know, a few years ago on a route runner's trip, I had the, uh, the the really the privilege of having a night uh, in a hut with Colin Ralph, and it was just him and I. And you know, Colin's a great talker, and he has lots of great stories to tell. And so. This trip that he did with um, Mary McBride was one of the many trips that he, he told me about. So, you know, we were pretty, I was pretty pumped about this trip, and you know, one of the cool things about booking a trip kind of nine months out is you have a lot of time to prepare and you know, get excited about it. So, did a whole lot of research and you know, digging into Moyer's guide and you know, finding, finding the bivvy locations and Mapping them up on on View Ranger, you know, reading all of the trip reports, and it was yeah, it's just awesome fun. It was kind of uh, I think planning the trip was you know nearly as much fun as doing it. So this is the this is the the elevation profile. So these are the five passes. You've got Sugar Sugarloaf Pass, which is just up from the end of the route burn. You've got um, Park Pass. You've got Cow Saddle. Fiery coal and uh, on uh, saddle, and it's it's 75 k's. It's about 400 meters of 4,000 4, meters of dirt in it. The thing that's super cool about this country is that you've got you know for the first probably four or five hours and the last maybe six hours. There's, there's some track and there's some markers, and then the rest of it is just this very faint route, which means like you're basically like there are no markers, there's no footpath, there's just landmarks, and and it's big, awesome country. So I think you know these are the three things that stood out to me about this route is that you're on the spine of the Southern Alps. You've got no huts, so you've just got these really cool rock bibs, and that really adds a, a whole new element for me and being in the mountains. And you get to touch into the Olivine Wilderness area, which is one of the you know, one of the greatest remote areas in New Zealand. So, just looking at the spine, so this is you know, this here is the spine of the of the Southern Alps. And this is this shows our this is kind of day two. So this is going up the rock burn and up over up over Park Pass. Hidden Creek is somewhere on the other side there. <laughs> um, and then this is coming up over Cow Saddle, up over Fiery Coal. And now you're getting into the Olivine Ledge, and then up to the the Fong Lakes, and you know, so you know this again. This is the that's the spine of the, the Southern Alps. And this is this is looking north from kind of the northernmost northernmost point we got to. And this is the Merkel, what's left of the Merkel Glacier, up, um, you know, looking up from the, from the top of Fond Saddle. 
this is the bigger of the, the lakes. So there's two lakes up here. And we had, so the lake is just below 1500 meters and the freezing level for, for our night up here was just below 1500. So <laughs> um, this is a drink bottle after our night out. And <laughs> it was really flipping cold. And we were traveling pretty light. So it was one of those nights that it was so cold you couldn't sleep. Like, yeah. you know, I got up a few times. I was doing sit-ups, star jumps, just trying to get warm enough <laughs> so that I could get to sleep. I think, you know, Grant slept a little better because he had his deluxe bivvy. He had his deluxe bivvy. <laughs> Last time he used that was in his garden. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this, this was his first. This was his first adventure. Um, so yeah, I think a bloody cold night, but spectacular. You know, it's like, what a great spot. So then the rock bivs. So this is the this is the rock bivv at Theatre Flats, which is where we spent the first night. And it's a great little fireplace there, there's a bucket to go and get water, um, you know, it looks like these bivs get used quite quite well, you know, a good place to get out of the wind and cool spot, this is up at Park Pass, so all of these huge boulders which make for great bivs. And then this is, this is uh, the biv at the end of the Olivine Ledge, and in here there's you, know, you can see the straw on the ground, there was a gas, spare gas canister there. Just amazing, you know, you sleep poor people in there really comfortably. And then this is uh, the split rock bird, which is on the Bensburn, so on the other on the on the other side of the saddle. And this is from the outside of this has actually got three different rooms you can sleep in on the <laughs> side of the bird. Uh, and I'm not sure how many of you saw the article about those that young group that did that Southern Alps traverse. A few nodding heads. So they used this bit as their last um, food storage spot. So, so you know they just popped down off the spine of the Southern Alps, filled up, and and went again. And then just think, looking at the Olivine Wilderness area. So this is fiery coal. Amazing country. That um, red rock is super grippy. Great for great for travelling on. This is looking northwest um, out over the Olivine wilderness area, and this is looking back down to Glen Orkey, down to Lake uh, Wakatipu, down to Bensburn, which was our way out. And this, so this is where we camped. The, um, the second night, and that's looking out west, southwest towards the Durham Mountains. So, you know, just amazing. This is our $40 fly that we bought at uh, Torpedo 7 in Queenstown on the way, and it lasted about two hours in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> Have you posted a review? <laughs> no, no, I should do that. Should do that. One memory, I remember, is uh, when we were at the Alpine Lake, Andy did a, a nerdy dip, which is pretty impressive uh, considering the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't so keen. <laughs> How did he warm up after? Do you know, see, see, that's one of the best things, right? I, when you go submerge yourself in freezing cold water like that, as soon as you get out, you get this hot rush. It's great. <laughs> Um, who, who has read this? Who has got this book? Jeff Spearpoint's book he released about a year and a half ago. So this is amazing. Like, if you're looking for inspiration for amazing outdoor adventures in New Zealand, specifically in the Southern Alps, this is a must read. It is full to the brim of incredible outdoor adventures. Uh, just quickly some gear photos. So this is Grant's gear. Grant had the big pack. He uh, took a little bit more than everyone else. <laughs> um, if anyone's interested in gear, I, I've got a nerdy list you can have a look at later. 
Uh, and if you're interested in seeing videos while you're sitting in a lower hut of the pictures, <laughs> uh, you can find them on my YouTube channel. Chamonix of the South, mate. What's that? Chamonix of the South. Chamonix of the South. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Well done, Andy. So, uh, thanks, Andy. Great talk there. Um, does awesome adventures. So, the last two parts of the evening, one is, will be the SK certificate handouts. And the next will be the Tararua Awards that um, Tim will do. Um, what should we do first? The awards or the SPAN? Okay, so Joe, you're going to hand out the thing, the um, certificates. So, yeah, unfortunately, four for six can't be here tonight, but we'll send out the certificates if they want to send me their um, addresses. <laughs> Otherwise, um, <laughs> so, Joe, which one do you want to do? Sam and Stephen Z. So, you can take over if you want, but those are here times. Oh, we're not going to have that, only those here. Oh, Alistair, Josh. Josh? No, no, no just three years old, mate. I just yeah, didn't yeah. pick it up for a speed. You've got to do the times. Uh, okay. you got to you you take three out of the gate. You do it, you do the points. Good day everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Joe Murphy. Um, I'd just like to say I feel really privileged to come along tonight. Last year I was sitting where you guys are, and so it's a bit of a buzz to be able to you know, be part of the event. And I would say thanks so much to Martina, you know, you're the, you're the daily email, you're the impetus, you're the drive, uh, you're the little voice in your ear. I email you. What you're saying is I email you all the time. <laughs> and, um, and also thanks very much to Jean and to Andy for your, um, your presentation, it was awesome. Um, to me I find it's really inspiring and I, just, I feel like I'm a regular dude and to see people going and doing this amazing thing is just a massive inspiration for me. When I started out doing my SK there were a bunch of things I learned after I did them that I I wouldn't have even thought of before I started. Um, you know that, that feeling when you're you said bye to your drop off and you're running into the dark and you can feel a pain of fear in your stomach. It's like, oh, oh that's a bit weird. I feel like, you know, what happens if I break my leg now? I'm stuck here for the next 12 hours until someone comes to find me. You know? Or that feeling as you're uh, leaving the bush line and you're coming out on the tops and you start to see the day ahead of you. You know, it just gives you that energy to get out there and carry on. Or the feeling as you're coming down through the puffer or the march and, and you make it to the cable park at Kiwi Ranch and you're like, yes, there's literally like 200 metres to go and I'm out. <laughs> I mean, some of these things I just never thought I'd appreciate or feel as I read through everyone's write-ups on the SK website. So yeah, it's pretty awesome. To know what you've all gone through. Right, certificates. We have three. First cab off the rank, I think, to do was Sam. And Sam, in, in his own way, set out humbly to go into a main range and ended up taking out the FKT. He took it off uh, Glenn, who said in 2017, so how long for three years? In a time of 21.15. So, congrats. Next up, I have uh, it's Chris. Who's Chris? Yeah, Chris. His second go in 21 days on the main range. I'm pretty sure most mortal people would have said, I'm not going back for a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> you went and took it out. So well done in a time of 23 hours. Well done. 22.53. The others, so Ryan Carr, 
finished his main range. I've got it as 21.16, 30 seconds over 80k and six and a half, seven thousand metres of climbing. 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty yeah, good at that. It's pretty good at that. Carapodian run. Two minutes? Yeah, six minutes. Uh, six seconds. Six seconds? <laughs> <laughs> um, we also had um, Hannah and Ashley who did their main range 23.35, which was pretty awesome as well. First female team to go through. I was up at Hector that day. And yeah. It was miserable. It was miserable. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. They did more. Yeah. Um, yeah. They did more. They did more. <laughs> and pocket time. Yeah, and I had a couple of extra notable activities for the year, if that's what happened to add to the... Um, so there was Katie and Alan doing the... Katie and Alan doing the first um, female team to do turn under 24 hours. So. And one thing I thought was pretty impressive, because Michael wasn't here, he didn't look as good. What Michael did was pretty impressive. But John Mellish, 61. 61, good call, yeah, yeah. Escape Valleys. He's the oldest Escape Valleys. Yeah, yeah, so like, we've got like at least 20. And you know what? (laughs) (laughs) Pay yourself. He's talking of Tarn. Tarn is Tarn. Is he? Yeah, he's talking about it. He goes, if you don't train for it, it won't put you off. (laughs) (laughs) Talk of the summer of getting the A team back, Craig Blacklock, SK30, Tom, you know, mate, and I'll, I'll bail it, I might. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for that. For this, it's the last part of the evening. Uh, Tim Sutton will be handing out the Terror Award, and I won't attempt the full name, but you can take from here. Cheers, <laughs> Chris. Okay, so, um, hey everyone. <laughs> it's an awesome room here. I think um, just just seeing all these people that, that have stepped up to the challenge, um, and, and just, just because it's something cool to do, and, and the, the place that we get to do it is, is um, pretty special. Um, it's, it's so good to see. I think one of those things um, when you're out there um, attempting a main range um, and then you come out successful at the other end is quite often you realise that you're a lot more capable of um, doing these big things. Like I still remember back to when I first started um, thinking about it after Chris planted the seed, um, after, after the A100 I think it was, and um, five hours was a long run for me, and then you get the main range, and then it's, well, what else can I do? Um, and I think our friend um, Chris Swallow, um, he, he had a vision um, when him and Laurie first uh, went to replicate what Colin Rolfe did. Um, there were nobody nobody else had done it under 24 hours um, and then they decided that they would um, try and start this groundswell and so um, Chris in a, in a lot of ways was a visionary um, and without him we wouldn't have this room full of people um, who can share in this, um, this pretty special achievement um, and so um, Chris came up with the concept of the Patu Whairehe Award um, as basically um, something, an award for people who have maybe done a main range or done a tarn um, or just want to try and challenge themselves in another way in, in the Tararu ranges and so basically the idea behind it is um, it's an award for the extraordinary human endeavour in the Tararu range um, sort of above and beyond an SK, um, a, <laughs> a normal SK if you can call it that, <laughs> there's nothing normal about it. And um, so it's to be, be awarded to a local runner um, and 
while also acknowledging runners from further afield, um, such as Michael, um, who have um, made us part of the family, um, and us them, um, and, and coming into the Tararua and, and doing amazing things. Um, Michael already had, has a quarter on here. Um, he was one of the recipients uh, last year with Marie for their doubles. Um, and so, sorry, I'll just find out where we got to. So we get to this year's recipient, um, and she needs no introduction. Um, you've already heard her talk about her experience down the range. Um, she became the first person to complete a single push traverse of the Tararua 1500s as an SK. Um, I'd like to invite Jean Jellybean the machine. <laughs> <laughs> a quarter on here for you, Jean, and the hope is that we can spread this all the way out here um, with people pushing themselves in the range. So, um, the, the only, just, just to put this in perspective, what Jean achieved, the only other known 1500s does, done as an SK um, was back in 1998 when um, Andrew McClellan and Jonathan Kennett. Um, they departed Putara um, on a Friday night, I think it was about 7 o'clock in the evening. Um, had their first sleep when they went to Cattle Ridge, so they actually went a different route from um, Jane and, and myself. Um, and had a sleep there, I think Jonathan, uh, it sounds, sounds like he didn't bring a sleeping bag, he, he slept between the mattresses, or tried to sleep between the mattresses. <laughs> and then they carried on up um, over Waingawa. Um, over the, the Nali Ridge to Bannister, past Rolf, um, and then had to double back down to Logan, um, and then slowly progress through the rest of the day. Uh, had another sleep at Tower Hut, um, and I, I think Jonathan again, <laughs> again uh, between the mattresses, um, and then for some reason they had actually decided that um, Coin Ridge was probably the best exit from the, the mountain to complete, <laughs> to complete the trip out to Kaitoki. <laughs> uh, I, I, to, to be honest, reading about Jonathan, I imagine he'd probably been on Coin Ridge, so I don't know what possessed him. Um, and so they, they had a third sleep, um, a baby on Coin Ridge. Um, the, the night beat them there. Um, I imagine they'd probably run out of head torch. And so they were late to work. I think they got out at about 10 o'clock. Um, in the afternoon in a time of 53 hours. Um, so, um, Jean's single push, 36 and a half hours, is um, something pretty amazing. Going into that Almost second time. night. Almost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Going, in, in, a, in a different route again. Yeah. I think that's, that's the cool thing about the 1500s, yeah. is um, there's a lot of route options here. Um, yeah, so. so fast, you don't really know, do yeah. you? <laughs> no, no, and I think it could change, could change if uh, which kind of gets a bit of yeah. foot travel. But um, yeah, amazing effort, amazing effort. I think young fellas could do it in 30 hours. There's only one for us. There's only one for us. But the, the funny thing was, the funny thing was that um, I just finished uh, putting uh, Jean's Kuru in here, and then I caught wind of another adventure um, underway, uh, or, or in, in the plannings last week. And um, so on Thursday, I'd put the last coat of uh, Dana Shaw on this that had just dried, and then um, our man. Michael Stewart headed into the range from Kaitoki um, into the night, um, into a blood moon, and um, yeah, again just amazed us with that, that mental fortitude of turning around at uh, Putara um, with, a, with a day running in your legs to go back down those valleys. And so um, I was back into the workshop and <laughs> so. Um, Michael uh, now has his um, his mark twice on um, 
the Fatu Parehe Award, um, then we're really proud to have you on the club. Brilliant. Yeah, so that sums it up. But yeah, um, I'd like to reiterate um, that yeah, some of the stuff that's been achieved and nicely spoken to him because it really does. I was, I was really appreciative of you saying what Chris had done and Lawrence and Colin and that they really set the ground swell of what everyone is doing. Um, but yeah, we're bringing real good brotherhood to this um, to this to this range um, and people from not just around the local parts, but like Michael, really good people. Um, I'd like to say the most, obviously we all know that, everyone knows inherently they look after each other in the range and there's a real safety aspect. Um, that's the fact, that's the reason why these things are so special. We're doing these things, but we all realize where in the beauty is there's also an underlying danger. New Zealand wilderness is tough. We all know that now, Broad has close, close calls. Um, but everyone's there for each other, and that camaraderie and support um, is very important, and, and it's inherent in everything you see around um, the community at the moment. So it's a special thing, and let's keep it going and inspire the younger generations to get up in the hills, like Graham Dingle did, and other people um, did for the people that are doing big things now. It's a really good to have role models, and I think people have that now. So, yeah, well done, everyone, and let's long live the SK. Okay. Yeah.